today we're going to get into Hebrews chapter 13, verses 18 to 19. So this is going to be the final exhortation from the author of Hebrews to his audience so that uh, uh, they may lead a Christian life. So this is going to be focused on prayer itself. Uh, to lead us into this topic, of course, we're going to be using uh, Psalm 102 in prayer unto our Lord. So, Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion, he appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looks down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord looks at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord, and in Jerusalem his praise, when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. He has broken my strength in mid-course, he has shortened my days. O oh my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days, you whose years endure throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So Psalm 102 uh, uses prayer as mm, some of the guiding motif. Now, of course, uh, Psalm 102 is going to be about the individual in this world who feels struck down by God because you're facing such challenges in this world. So uh, the psalmist who's speaking that prayer is attributing the disaster to God, in a sense, where God is the one who is uh, putting the individual down low. But uh, the psalmist also realizes his hope is going to be in the Lord. So if you're going to be praying, well, you're going to be praying to the one who can save you. So uh, throughout, there's mentions of prayers, and there's also mentions of groanings, which are going to be the prayers that you have in a state of suffering unto the Lord for your deliverance. So yes, Psalm 102 is looking always to the Lord in prayer and in a, a fervent need. Now, of course, this is also mimicked in uh, other psalms, like Psalm uh, 88 is one that comes to mind. It's, it's far more drastic than Psalm 102. Uh, psalm 88 is looking to, um, uh, to God in absolute despair, and there is no um, resolution to that psalm. Now, in, in Psalm 102, it ends with, um, recognizing God is from everlasting to everlasting, even though things in this world will fall apart, uh, mainly because of sin, but things in this world will fall apart. 
Uh, well, God will still endure, and since he endures, then he who calls his people will the people that he will endure alongside him. Psalm 88 doesn't end like that. So Psalm 88 tends to be a bit more drastic. Uh, we also have something similar in uh, the uh, outcries of Job, because Job himself is praying many times in the book of Job, and he's always looking to God for um, um, restitution, uh, 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 reconciliation, because Job, because of his immense suffering, is seeing this as a broken relationship with God. Of course, God never breaks his relationship with Job. God is the one who praises Job for, for the faithfulness of Job, and Job always turns to the Lord in prayer, even when he has somewhat uh, drastic and even uh, surprising things to say as, from somebody in the faith, uh, much like you would find in Psalm 102, which is still the psalmist crying out to God, well, this, this horror that I'm going through, this is what you're allowing, uh, so please deliver me from it. So we definitely want to pray to God at all times, but we're also remembering to pray to God uh, uh, when it's bad, even, even when we are thinking, well, maybe it is... Uh, God himself, who is against us. Um, but this is what prayer is for, is so that we can reconcile with God that we may have a conversation. Because if you're looking to people in this world uh, where you have broken relationships, just not having the relationship isn't going to repair the relationship because that's just perpetuating the distance. Uh, what needs to occur is a type of reconciliation which happens through communication, that you're actually uh, talking to this person in hopes of reconciling. Of course, since we're in a sin-soaked world, it's not going to work out in the sense that uh, every single bad relationship you, ha relationship you have, it, it, it must end in a reconciliation. Um, um, we just can't say that here because we're dealing with um, uh, our sin and we're dealing with sinners. So there's going to be issues within this world, but in God, uh, we can trust that there will be a reconciliation because this is in part what he promises to us, that there will be a foundation of salvation, uh, and this is made a concrete in Jesus Christ our Lord, whose work upon the cross is what brings us uh, back to God, which reconciles us back to God, Colossians 1.20. So by the way of his cross, uh, Jesus is the one who takes away our sins so that we are no longer sinners before God and we receive Christ's righteousness so that we may be perfect before God and perfectly reconciled with him, not, not having our sins counted against us in God's presence, but uh, being found uh, perfect and complete before him. And First Corinthians, sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, now the author of Hebrews, when he gets into that particular motif, uh, he's looking this more as... Um, sacrificial offerings so that uh, we know that the atonement made on the cross is a the universal atonement like that this is the way that you are saved not not even the old testament sacrifices could have mediated um mediated your relationship as, as best as christ could so whereas the old testament sacrifices had to be again again christ sacrifice is complete and by way of christ sacrifice and the reception of his blood, uh, we are made perfect before God. We are perfectly sanctified before God. Of course, we're still sinners, so we're still going to be fighting against sin, which is also why the author of Hebrews has to exhort us to, uh, to do what is proper in the faith, uh, because we're tempted to sin and not do these things. Yet before God, we are still seen as Christ-like. Christ, Christ has clothed us with himself and uh, we are pure as he is pure. And this is a promise made through faith, because in faith uh, we are constantly receiving the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, constantly being made pure, constantly being drawn back to our Heavenly Father, that we may uh, receive the formal declaration of forgiveness in, in the Word in the sacraments, God's Word in the sacraments, uh, that we may know that, yes, we are uh, forgiven, made pure, that uh, all, all sinful pollutions in us are... Um, uh, temporary, that they are all uh, taken away by God, uh, and in part this happens by way of prayer. So this is what we have for confession and absolution. So God promises to us that he will hear us in prayer, and that he will actually reconcile us to himself. So even though we fall into sin, uh, God promises that he will hear us 
our confession and he will forgive us our sins. And this is what happens, confession, absolution. So while we know that when we confess our sins unto our Lord, he will forgive our sins because he promises this explicitly in scripture. First uh, John 1, 8 to 9, if you want specific reference. Uh, but we also know that God has appointed uh, people in his church to hear your confession so that by way of your confession unto the Lord through that individual who's acting in the office of ministry, uh, God will hear your prayer and that person when they pronounce absolution over you that your sins are forgiven, uh, that absolution is reflective of God himself. In fact, in the Lutheran order for, for private confession, uh, there is an instance where I as a pastor would say, do you believe that the forgiveness I say is the forgiveness of God. And then individual can say yes. So it's like, so it is as you believe. Your sins are forgiven you. Uh, now, of course, there's more words than that. But essentially, that's what's going on is because God has placed me and uh, all of the pastors into the office of holy ministry is put all of us into that position for the forgiveness of sins that you may be reconciled to your God. So even though uh, you have uh, sinned against the Lord, you are forgiven, you are reconciled back to God. And this is all done through the blood of Jesus Christ's sacrifice yet again. So uh, because God has put forth Christ for you, uh, you need not be concerned uh, that uh, your relationship with God is absolutely broken, even when you feel that it is, uh, when you're praying unto the Lord, the Lord is hearing you because you're praying on account of faith, is that you're, you're going to him in prayer. So even somebody who's saying very, very drastic things like our psalmist in Psalm 2 or the psalmist, Psalm 89, uh, or, or 88, I mean, or even Job himself in the book of Job, uh, God is still listening to all those prayers and he's uh, still uh, trying to bring you to himself. So even though what you have to say is shocking because you might be saying, God, why are you doing this to me? Uh, God still wants you wants to hear you say that. Uh, still wants you to come to him in prayer because again, he's the only one who can help. So why would he want you to go anywhere else with whatever words that you have? He'd rather you speak what is authentic to you, what, what you actually believe to be true so that you may have an honest conversation for an honest reconciliation. But uh, let's get into the specific text for today, which is going to be on prayer itself, of course. So Hebrews chapter 13, verses 18 to 19. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, yeah, a, a relatively short snippet uh, in comparison to some of the larger things that I've done in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, of course, uh, lar larger passages. But, yeah, so, so the author of Hebrews is asking uh, all the recipients to pray for us. Now, of course, we have to think, well, who's the us and who, are the, who is the you that you're asking to pray for? Yeah. Um, so, of course, the, the people who are receiving this, receiving the book of Hebrews, they're going to be the ones who are urged to pray. Now, in one sense, like this is going to be for a relatively specific group. This is going to be for the intended uh, recipient of the letter originally. But this is broadening itself out to the church at large because the book of Hebrews is what we call an encyclical letter. This is the same as the other letters of the New Testament. They're encyclical letters. And encyclical means that it's going around, that it's being circulated. So uh, the early church is spreading around the book of Hebrews because it's saying this is an apostolic writing. This is the word of God. This is uh, what we have to understand the faith. So... Uh, when, when the people are receiving this, it's not just going to be the one congregation the, or congregations who are the recipients of the letters. Now, of course, uh, uh, St. Paul, for example, he wrote his letters to specific congregations and individuals, but the book of Hebrews, it actually doesn't have any address. Like at the very beginning, it's not saying uh, who's it being 
sent to, nor even at the end does it have any specific instructions about who's the actual recipient. It's just going to be the brothers, uh, which refers to the brothers and sisters in the Christian church. So if you're a Christian, this is for you, more or less. Uh, there's definitely going to be a, a recipient, at, but there could actually have been uh, copies of the book of Hebrews. So the author um, wrote it down, maybe copied it out a few different times, maybe sent it to several congregations, we don't know. But whatever the case may be, this was for the church at large. Like this isn't just narrowly defined for one congregation. The author of Hebrews is trying to make sense of the entirety of the New Testament, uh, sorry, the entirety of the Old Testament as applied to Jesus Christ. So really, this is helpful for everybody in the church, which is why it was circulated among the early church so that we could understand uh, the Old Testament in light of Christ, that Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and through Christ we have salvation, uh, a salvation which could never have been achieved by the Old Testament and covenant because that covenant never brought about exactly what it promised because we were always um, guilty of sin. The people were always guilty of sin and could never be found uh, pure under that covenant. There was always a yet another sacrifice to be made. But in Christ's perfect sacrifice, like this ends um, all, all the sacrifices and we are actually made pure forever. So we no longer have to look to a future sacrifice. Now we're just looking into God fulfilling his promises in the end, bringing us into the heavenly homeland, as it were, uh, with the resurrection. So, do we know specifically who this was for? Not really. But we can definitely say that this is the church. So if we're receiving the instruction, pray for us. So this is um, well, an imperative, and an imperative is going to be for uh, second person, so it's basically you pray for us. So the you in you pray is going to be everybody who receives this letter, which is not just going to be about the uh, uh, um, uh, the people that immediately receive the letter. It's going to refer to the entire ancient church who are, who was reading this, and even for us today, generations afterwards. So we're going to be praying for all those who are going to be um, bringing us into the faith. Uh, since this comes right after the the exhortation to obey your leaders in the church, like we can even expand this out so it's not just the author of Hebrews, but it's going to be uh, more people. It's going to be uh, anybody who leads you in the faith. So it's also pray for pray for your leaders in the church, uh, pray for your pastors, for your deacons, for or the bishops, for. Well, maybe the Archbishop, if you're, if you're part of the Church of England, or, or Cardinals, if you're part of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, pray for all those who are leading you in the church. Now, the us part is also going to be a little bit uh, difficult to try and nail down, because the author of Hebrews is not uh, identified. Like he, he doesn't say who he is. And, of course, it's using... A plural form, so saying us, so it could actually be that this is going to be multiple individuals, or maybe it's one individual who is writing in conjunction with other people around him. And this is what we find for uh, quite a number of Paul's letters, is that even though Paul is going to be the main writer, uh, he's also writing with, uh, at different points in time, Timothy or, or Sylvanus or, or somebody else, uh, because St. Paul is... Uh, not just sending a message to a congregation uh, alone, but he's going to be talking with uh, the fellow travelers who he traveled with to that congregation. So he's like, yeah, the greetings from not just me, but from uh, these other people that you know. So uh, here's all this information that you need. This is all the encouragement you need. So, uh, and pray for us as well. Same thing with the book of Hebrews. Like the, you have the author of Hebrews uh, who might be the main author. This might be a bit more of a collaborative project. Uh, but it could just be the main author is writing this with a couple other people in mind saying, well, pray for all of us. Or it could just be that there is one author and he's saying, pray for me as well as all the other leaders in the church, because that came up right before them, <laughs> before this. Because it says, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. So it could just be that the author of Hebrews is saying, obey your leaders, 
that will pray for us in the sense of me and the rest of the leaders that you have. Could be. Difficult to say. Uh, but uh, 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 the it, it kind of comes down to a head where you get to some of the closing verses. So in verses uh, 22 and uh, 23, uh, it switches from us, which is a plural, to I. So it seems to be that there is a singular author of the book of Hebrews. So it could just be that pray for us in the sense of pray for all of us as leaders, like all the leaders that you have, pray for all of us. Or it could be the sense of uh, the author of Hebrews being the main speaker and then praying for anybody else who the author is associated with, who whatever journeyman that he's traveling around with, uh, greeting the other congregations. So who's the main author? And this is going to be the major question of the book, but uh, yeah, we don't know. This has been an area of contention since the authorship of Hebrews because no one actually attaches their name to the book of Hebrews and we don't get uh, another writer clearly identifying, uh, like a church father who is speaking later on, clearly identifying who wrote the book. Now, for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like none of those have names attached to them, but you have people who knew the, those individuals, uh, first-hand or second-hand, and they clearly identified, okay, well, so-and-so wrote this book, so-and-so wrote that book, so-and-so wrote that. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, what we have from Papias. Papias was a student of St. John, and he says, okay, well, Matthew is this book, like Mark is this, uh, Luke is this, and John did this. So Papias is one who was taught by John, basically knew who wrote what, and ever, and some of the earliest documents that we actually have of those books where we see them in um, a quoted form, or like somebody's citing this in a different work, or if we have actual fra manuscript fragments, um, if you're looking at the beginning of the, the book in those fragments, as well as all the other side of, uh, writings, like everybody's going to be attributing this to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, because this, these are the people that you know. So we don't actually have that with the book of Hebrews. It's kind of a mystery. Now, some people originally put it uh, as as the work of St. Paul, and this was one of the main theories, even up until the Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther, when he's talking about the book of Hebrews, he's referring to this as the work of St. Paul, even though um, by Luther's day like that, that uh, major theory was very much falling out of out of favor. Uh, likely, it is not Paul, uh, because we have everything by Paul being named. We also have a whole bunch of um, other uh, uh, people comparing what's going on in Hebrews, like all the grammar and other stuff, to the other letters of Paul. So there's a little bit of um, difference between this and what we find in, in other Pauline writings. So if Paul doesn't attach his name to it, uh, it's unlikely that Paul himself wrote it. However, it does bear a lot of similarities with everything Paul writes, because this was what sparked the original idea that this was written by Paul. And uh, we have here at the very end, so it says, um, I know that, this is verse 23 in Hebrews chapter 13. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. So we know that the author of Hebrews is a companion of Timothy. So uh, that would be St. Paul. Paul is one of the companions of Timothy. Now there are quite a few different companions of Timothy. So uh, it narrows it down a lot, but uh, we don't have a very definitive uh, understanding of who this is. So, since it bears similarities to Paul, it bears that this person is a companion of Timothy, and we also uh, can make some connections to other biblical writers. In fact, it says um, here in verse 18, so this is part of the meditation that we have. Well, I know we haven't gotten to the actual prayer section. We're talking about the authorship of the book, uh, but for the actual prayer section, the author is saying, we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably. So, um, oh, sorry. And so that I may be restored to you soon. So the word, so the phrase clear conscience actually comes up in uh, the, the letter of 1 Peter. Uh, that's the encouragement for being baptized, is uh, you're baptized to have a clear conscience in Jesus Christ's uh, uh, death and resurrection. 
And then uh, first and second Peter use the word restored, and it's a relatively rare word in in uh, uh, the scriptures, the New Testament. It only occurs, I believe it's seven times uh, when I looked that up. So we could actually say, well, maybe Peter wrote this. Because also at the very end here, in verse 24, it says, Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. So this person is also in association with the Italian church, or the Roman church, if you will. And St. Paul and St. Peter are actually in connections with that church. So Peter is not, necess is not exactly connected with St. Timothy, but he is definitely connected to the Italian church. So maybe he wrote, uh, sorry, uh, maybe he had met uh, Timothy when he was there. Uh, Timothy being a companion to Paul, maybe he met up with Paul there and got introduced to Peter and the rest is history. Maybe, maybe that occurred. So could Peter have written this book? Well, pro probably not. <laughs> Uh, because it does not read anything like 1 Peter or 2 Peter. 1 Peter and 2 Peter are both very different styles. It's most likely that uh, 1 Peter was written with Peter's actual style because there's a lot of thoughts compressed in very short spaces, which is what you expect from Peter is that he likes to say a whole bunch of stuff and connect a whole bunch of ideas together, uh, which is how he speaks other, other places in, in the New Testament is that he always goes to the first things in his head and he puts an idea after idea after idea. Even with the Pentecost sermon that we have in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter is putting scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture and, and he, he elaborates on them a little bit, but he keeps doing more and more and more. So this doesn't read like First Peter. Hebrews is a very, very uh, drawn out and thought out and an extremely structured book, whereas First Peter is not as st structured or it is... Um, uh, linear in tone as the book of Hebrews, or chiastic in tone as the book of Hebrews. Um, first Peter is definitely structured, though. Uh, second Peter, uh, most likely dictated by Peter, written down by uh, a, a, a very different individual than First Peter. So they're both likely dictated to individuals who are writing these letters down. So dictated by Peter, uh, Peter probably didn't write them himself, but uh, he was dictating this to somebody else. So Second Peter most likely um, written down by somebody else. And that style is very, very different, uh, very, very fluid, and, and it goes into idea after idea after idea. So it's not really done in kind of the same style as, as Hebrews. Um, word use is also a little bit different, but yeah. So probably not Peter, though. Uh, we could also go with John. John, um, he was... Well, we can see quite a few themes in the Gospel of John appear in the book of Hebrews. Maybe not in the same wording, per se, but quite a few of the ideas appearing in Hebrews. But um, that's not going to be... Uh, that's not going to be the authorship. Like, John is one of the least likely authors of, of Hebrews. Because um, it says, from the church in Italy, John did not go to Italy that we know of. Like, he, main, he remained mostly in uh, the Greek city-states, and, and other locations. Uh, John himself also has a very different writing style, and even though some of the ideas in Hebrews mimic some of the ideas in, in the Gospel of John, um, mostly not, not, not him. Okay. This brings us again back down to somebody who had visited Italy, companion of, of uh, St. Paul, possibly also companion of St. Peter and uh, companion of Timothy is in particular. So there's actually a, a few different names that could pop up here. Uh, one of them would be uh, St. Luke himself, because St. Luke was a companion of Paul also during the time that Timothy was a companion of St. Paul. Um, Luke's gospel also draws a little bit from Paul's letters in terms of word usage. Um, if, if you compare 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it's talking about the Lord's Supper with uh, Luke chapter 22 when it's talking about the Lord's Supper, like they're very similar accounts. They, they have more similarities between those two than they have with uh, Matthew or Mark in, 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 in terms of uh, looking at differences between all four accounts. So uh, Luke 
most likely got quite a bit of his information from St. Paul. So you see quite a bit of correlation between Luke and uh, kind of some of the Pauline thoughts. So Hebrews could have been written by Luke. Uh, we also have um, maybe uh, Silvanus or Epaphroditus. So we're also companions of Paul, who are also companions of, of Timothy. Epaphroditus is mentioned in Philippians in the same breath as say, uh, uh, Timothy himself. Or right after, anyways. Uh, but uh, one of the favored theories is uh, Barnabas. So Barnabas was the one who converted well before St. Paul. Uh, he pops up in Acts chapter 5, uh, Barnabas. And Barnabas is one of the early companions with St. Paul, and he goes on the first couple uh, uh, missionary journeys with Paul. So they go to Asia Minor and all that. Um, but when St. Paul wants to go to Greece, they have a falling out because of... Uh, including somebody else on the trip, John Mark. So Paul doesn't want to include him because Mark had abandoned them. Barnabas does want to include him, give him a second chance, and then they split ways on this. So Barnabas uh, goes off into his own thing. We don't really hear about him that much because Luke is the one who's authoring Acts, and he's traveling on with St. Paul. So Barnabas actually could have been the author of Hebrews, and there's been quite a few people who have championed that idea. So there we go. That's the authorship. So we have pray for us. So who's the audience? Well, immediately it's going to be who, have, who is uh, the recipient of this letter. But we also know that it's beyond that. It's whoever is the recipient of this letter throughout all generations. So everybody's supposed to be praying. Who are they praying for? Well, they're praying for us. So the author of Hebrews, yes, of course, you're praying and that the saints may continue in the faith with God, of course. Uh, but that's kind of limited for earthly life, because you can commend the saints, the souls, unto the Lord at the passing of the individual. And basically, the the end decision is already sealed at that point in time. So we don't necessarily need to continue praying for the author of Hebrews, but we should continue praying for who's included in the us, which will be the leaders of the faith, especially the main leaders of the faith, those who are um, giving you sermons and other things, the letters, in order to encourage you in the faith to do what Christ is requiring you to do. So this is going to be anybody who is a leader in the church and contributing to the church. Okay, so pray for us there. Three words down, let's get to the rest of the two verses. So we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. So this certainty is not coming from the conviction of the individual. So the author of Hebrews, if he is actually a Christian at this point in time, which he is, of course, because he's written all this stuff out, um, he is very much concerned with the spiritual health of his hearers. This is why, in the book of Hebrews, there are several instances of him giving warnings, don't fall into sin, don't fall into unbelief. Uh, so the idea is, if you engage a lot in sin, well, this will eventually lead you into unbelief, so don't engage in sin because this is uh, the gateway to, dam to damnation. So even though Christ's sacrifice is complete at the cross, you are continuously forgiven in Christ, you receive this salvation in faith. It can only be given to you and received by you in faith. If you are uh, disconnecting yourself from God himself, if, if uh, you are experiencing suffering, for example, and you go, well, I don't need God, because he's just giving me suffering, and you decide not to pray for him, not to pray for deliverance, well, then God is going to do just as you desire, which is not going to give you uh, deliverance through prayer. So he's going to allow you to try to raise yourself above the suffering you're experiencing in this world, try to uh, allow you to live perfectly in this world, which you've already failed to do, because we're all sinners. So uh, if, if you're disconnected from God, if you're rejecting him uh, by way of sin or by the open denial of him, open, openly cursing God, then you would fall away from the faith and lose uh, salvation in Christ. So this is what the author of Hebrews is saying time and time again. So he's not saying that uh, we are sure that we have a clear conscience in the same way, in the sense that he is saying we, we cannot be damned. We, like there's no possible way for us ever to commit an error again. There's no possible way that we can sin. There's no possible way that we could not have a clear conscience with God in the se by, by uh, uh, ever 
ever engaging in sin or falling away from the faith. That's, that's not what the author of Hebrews is saying. By way of context within the entire book, the author, the author of Hebrews is saying that falling away from the faith is a real possibility. So, what he's saying here is, we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. So what is this actually tied to? What are, what are good works tied to? And this is going to be tied to Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Because the author of Hebrews in chapter 10 is saying that, well, let me just flip over to chapter 10. So in chapter 10, it says, um, Uh, let's let's have this in verse 13 and 14, chapter 10. So since that time, so the time of sacrifices, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So the author of Hebrews is saying, in in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, in that one sacrifice, he has made us perfect forever, those who are being made holy. So the idea is, yes, we are perfectly sanctified, but we still need to live in our sanctification. We still need to be made holy, but uh, all, all the work is actually already complete in Christ. So we're living this out, but it's already completed in Christ. So if, if Christ is the one who has brought this holiness into our lives, it's not as though we are the authors of our own clear conscience. We are the authors of our own goodness and good works. But all this is stemming from Christ himself. He is the one who has made us perfect. He has made us complete. He has sanctified us there. So whenever we're living by way of Christ's cross, living by way of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are living in uh, the perfection of Jesus. So he is saying, like, we have clear consciences. Not because we are sinless or that we've done away with sin in our lives completely, but we are sinless because Christ is taking away our sins. We have good consciences because Christ has taken away our sins. Which is uh, basically what Peter says when he brings up that same concept. So this is 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, and this is uh, verse uh, 21. So, and, and this, referring to the flood, so, and the flood of Noah is a type, or anti-type, sorry, uh, anti-type of baptism. Oh, sorry, no, it is a type, it is a type. I, I, I'm translating this in my head. <laughs> um, and the flood of Noah, which corresponds to, or is a type of the flood, or is a type of baptism, well, that now, Saves you. So the baptism itself, uh, St. Peter is saying, so baptism now saves you. I'm not, so I'm in the NIV. I don't like the NIV's specific wording on this because it's somewhat confusing. But um, baptism itself now saves you is basically what St. Peter is saying, and he's saying this is also corresponding to Noah's flood. So in Noah's flood, uh, the wickedness was taken out of the world, was swept away by the waters, and holiness remained with Noah and his family. So baptism corresponds to this. Holiness is holiness only remains in you by way of the gift of baptism, and the wickedness, the sinfulness, is uh, done away with. And he says, uh, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So St. Peter is saying that, yeah, your, your good conscience is not your own doing. It's not you being perfect, you being completely sinless in this world, but is on account of Christ's resurrection and, of course, the act of baptism. So baptism brings you to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, which makes you perfect for God, gives you the clear conscience. So the clear conscience is not your own doing, uh, but it is what God gives to you. So, the author of Hebrews is saying, we are sure that we have a clear conscience, so already present, and desire to live honorably in every way. So the desire to live honorably in every way is now the future action. So you're looking to all your actions in the future. Where is it coming from? From the good conscience, which is made by Jesus Christ's own sacrifice. 
So your desire is to live this out. Live out the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Live out in good works what's going on. Okay? And uh, verse 19 continues this thought. So I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. So this is also linking specifically with the individual. And it's talking about a very specific um, issue that the individual has. So the author of Hebrews is away from who, whoever he has in mind when he's writing the letter. And he wants to be restored to them, brought back to them. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, all they can do is uh, pray for this to come about. Okay? So when we're looking into prayer, so now we're going to get into the gener generics of prayer. So with prayer, it is communication between you and God. And that's how it's framed every single location it's found in the Bible, with the few exceptions, very few exceptions, of prayer being offered up to false deities. And, and these are examples basically of what not to do. But every single time that prayer comes up as a God-sanctioned act, it's always directed to God. It's never directed to other saints, regardless of what um, uh, Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox might say. Like, it's just not here. Uh, even when they're bringing up passages in, in the book of Revelation, uh, where it's... Uh, the, those in heaven, are, whether they be angels or the elders, uh, bringing up uh, bowls of incense of, of the prayers of the saints. Like, those prayers aren't addressed to those angels or their saints. Like, they're not. Like, we, you'd have to know the content of those prayers in order to say they're being addressed to those saints. Basically, the angels are just doing what the angels do, which are acting as messengers. They're conveying these messages unto God, that you're not praying to the angels, you're praying to God, and the angels are conveying these messages that that's their job is to convey messages uh when they when they appear in scripture in, in to human beings it's when god is conveying specific messages to human beings like again this this is their job is to be facilitators of communication that's what angel means that's what the that word means in it's a it's a comes from the greek the greek word angelos means messenger and uh, when it comes up in uh, the Old Testament, um, like again, the word means messenger. Like this, this is just what the word for angel means. They're always typified as messengers. Uh, anyways, so prayer is communication with God. And prayer itself can be div divided into many, many different categories. So there could be prayers for other people. There could be prayers for yourself. There could be prayer... There's for deliverance, salvation, there could be prayers for forgiveness, there could be prayer there's for uh thanksgiving unto the Lord for or or praising God. There's so many different things. But it's always going to be coming back to the idea of communication with the Lord, with the Almighty. That's always what it is. So when the author of Hebrews is encouraging people uh to pray, the author of Hebrews is saying Please communicate unto the Lord for our behalf. And, and this is something that we actually encourage people to do, is to pray on our behalf. Um, what we don't see in Scripture is anybody praying to saints to pray on our behalf, which is also what the Roman Catholics and some Eastern Orthodox would say. Is that, uh, but uh, the dead saints in heaven, they, they, they're still alive. Uh, otherwise, you don't believe in the resurrection or, or Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice, which is usually how they frame it when, when I make conversations with them. Anyways, they don't always say that. But uh, the saints in heaven are alive, therefore they are still praying for us. And I agree with that. They are still praying for us. Like in Revelation, they keep praying. Like this, this is the thing that they do. Uh, so therefore you can ask them to pray on our behalf. And I don't agree with that one. I don't agree with that one because we don't have any prayers anywhere directed to any saints. Like we have living people here speaking to other living people saying, please pray to God on our behalf. But we have no instance whatsoever of, hey, let's pray today saying so that they can pray on our behalf. We don't have that anywhere. 
Um, at which point, if you're already doing the action of prayer, why aren't you praying to God yourself? Because this is actually depicted as the most holy thing that you can actually do in this situation, uh, especially when you're in dire trouble, is like you're always directed to God. Looking to the example of Job, like he's always going to God. And those who are in sinful, sinful unbelief, they, they could not approach God at the end, so those would be the friends of Job. So what God tells Job is, pray on behalf of your friends, offer a sacrifice on behalf of your friends, so that they may be forgiven by way of uh, mediation. So we do see mediators going on in, in, in Scripture, namely priests, but Jesus as the great mediator, the, the great high priest, like, if we're praying unto Christ, well, he's going to be directing our, your prayers unto God. So we're not looking to priests anymore. We're not looking to mediators, even, even saints. We're looking primarily to Christ. So if you're asking somebody in this world to pray on in your behalf, sure. But if you're praying to a dead saint, you're making a whole bunch of assumptions there that we just can't make. And it only comes up uh, after a significantly later time where you actually have prayers to any of these saints. And... It develops its own cultus uh, later on. Um, many, many culti, actually. But, uh, yeah, it's not really a thing in the early church. It's definitely not in the scriptures. Okay, I digress. So, <clears throat> when we're praying, we're praying in, in, unto, the God, unto our Lord, uh, basically communicating so that our relationship may be sustained. Now, this is not prayers for the sustaining of the relationship per se, or I should say necessarily, because we do ask our God at different points in times in various services, uh, maybe you do so yourself, that, uh, uh, that, that you ask him to encourage you in the faith that you may never leave him or forsake him or anything of the sort. That, that would be a prayer for uh, continuance in the relationship. But most of our prayers are not going to be that. They're going to be uh, seeking help for daily issues, they're going to be thanking the God, our Lord for uh, what He has what He has given to us in this world. It's it's also going to be praising God for what He has done in the past, and we can go into even more categories. As I was saying, if if you want to divide the prayer out into a whole bunch of different categories, you can really divide it out. But uh, basically, you have uh, Thanksgiving pray. His supplication, and um, or or if you want a different wording, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Uh, different different types of prayers. These things uh, sustain our relationship with God, because if you think of um, maybe a marital relationship, a man and wife. Um, if, if they're just going, ah, well, I know my spouse loves me. I, I, don't need to, I don't need to say that I love you or thank them for what they do or ask them for anything. So, so if, you, if you can imagine a husband and wife uh, living together in the same household, and then they never speak a word to each other for years, is that going to be a healthy relationship? Absolutely not. Um, as healthy relationships depend on communication. Now, well, it, let's say you have a deaf couple, maybe they wouldn't be saying words, but they're still going to be signing to each other. There still needs to be some sort of communication, uh, whether it be uh, oral or verbal, like oral, verbal, uh, bodily, or, or something else. Like there needs to be some sort of communication so that you can keep the relationship healthy and going because you need to interact with somebody in order to keep a relationship going. It's, uh, it's when you stop doing things, when you stop interacting with them, that you're actually separated from that individual. So with God, we want to continue in our relationship with him. We should be praying so that we're with our Lord. And this is the book of Job, basically, is Job is the one who's coming to God in prayer, is that he is constantly trying to seek after God, seek after God, seek after God. He, he doesn't know what's going on, of course, in his life. His life is in shambles. He doesn't know what's going on, but he's still seeking after God. So regardless of his uh, misunderstandings of what's actually the case uh, in his life, that uh, God is maliciously attacking him, for example, um, 
Job is, Job is still seeking after God, still trying to reconcile with him. It's only once Job's words are ended, which happens in chapter 31 of the book, is that Job just has his final argument, then he just stops. And God now has to speak up. So uh, in between Job and, and God's speeches, of course, you have uh, Elihu. He, he's the one who speaks in between the two. Uh, but he's basically acting as a meteor, trying to guide Job's words back to God, trying to have Job reflect a bit more on what he's saying, and tries to open up the idea of, uh, well, God is the one who, who can do this, do that, and he can speak in such and such a way. And uh, Elihu is kind of framing this around God's talking out of a storm, if you will, and then God speaks in chapter 38, out of a storm. So uh, uh, God, God ended up speaking so that Job would not just end with his silence uh, because I would be destroying the relationship, but God actually speaks to Job so that Job must answer him. And that's God's opening phrase. It's like, brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, you will answer me. So uh, God himself does actually come to us to speak, and he does so through his word. We might not get what's called a theophany, that is a God speech, as uh, Job received a big booming voice from heaven. But we do have God speaking to us through his word. And whenever we're unsure about what God is trying to communicate to us, we can always go back to this. It might be confusing for us to try and understand what God might be telling us in this world, but well, simply through the word, because this is a very uh, particular form of the word. So it's saying, say like with the book of Hebrews, like pray for us. Well, who, who's praying? Well, the Congregation who receives this letter in it in the congregation say who's the us well it's the leaders at the author of Hebrews in their day but we can also apply this beyond that so you can always go to a pastor to see well what is this actually pertaining to like even beyond just the the history of the text what is this pertaining to well I said who's the you well it's the recipient of the book not just at the time there but in all times where we receive this book up from uh, uh, that is divinely inspired. Who's the us? Well, it's the leaders of the church, not just the author of Hebrews and the pastors in the first century, but we're looking to any leader in the church. You should be praying for those in the church that they may teach everybody rightly. So pray for us pastors. We're sinners like you are sinners. We need uh, all the prayer we can get so that we may lead the people rightly according to God's word and according to his sacraments. So uh, all, of, all of this is uh, looking back to God's word for us, of course. So in your side of the conversation, what you're doing is you're coming to God in prayer. So you hear God speak to you through his word in the scriptures, and now you respond back to him in prayer. And you respond to him with things particular to you. Now the author of Hebrews is saying, um, particular for him, so he's saying, I urge you to pray so that I may restore to you soon. So that is very typical very, very uh, specific to the time period, that the author of Hebrews himself is praying that he may be restored to the people that he's writing to. Like, that is a historical um, a limitation there. Now, of course, you might broaden that out to like, yeah, of course, we want to be praying for people that we can all interact with each other in the church. But uh, no, this, this is very much specific because the author of Hebrews is saying, I, I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. So we all have our own particular prayers. So having heard the word of God, having heard his side of the conversation, what do you have to say to him? Uh, what do you have to pray for? Are you going to be thanking God for uh, the breakfast you, you received this morning? Are you going to be thanking him that you came safely to your workplace? He's um, uh, given all the traffic and whatnot. Are you going to thank God for the job that you have in order to earn an income? Are you going, also going to be thanking God for all the blessings that he's given you in the faith, that he has forgiven you your sins, that he has brought you to faith, that he has given you uh, the word of the gospel that you might share it with others. Are you going to praise God for creating the world, for creating you specifically, for creating uh, your loved ones, and uh, creating opportunities for you in this world to do this, that, and the other thing? Like there's, there's quite a few things that we can... Uh, give to God in our side of the conversation. And it doesn't all have to be requests. 
Like quite a bit of this should be thanksgiving. Quite a bit of this should be praise. Um, but we do recognize that we do need a lot in this world. And this is, this is why the author of Hebrews is encouraging others to pray for him that they may receive something from God, which would be uh, a supplication. But that's the term for this. So for our supplications, we might ask for good health, good health for others. We might you know, ask that relationships be repaired in this world. We might ask that uh, maybe cars be repaired. Maybe <laughs> um, uh, We could ask for that we may receive food, that we need not worry about money, that we need not worry about this, that, and the other thing. Uh, there's lots of things that we can ask God for. And that's your side of the conversation. You're, you're looking at the scriptures, re realizing, yay, okay, God has given me opportunities to pray for him, and he promises that he will hear my prayer. So I'm going to pray to him, and I'm going to keep up my side of the conversation. So prayer is, to a large degree, about uh, facilitating conversation between you and God to, to keep the relationship going. So it's not just one side. It's not all God giving things to you and you never thanking him or acknowledging him in return, which is basically what uh, uh, atheists do. But God is giving all these things to you. So if you're thinking, hey, I need to actively engage in a relation, this relationship, then you'd be engaging in prayer with the Lord. Because, uh, yeah, again, the example with uh, man and wife, if they never say anything to each other, how do they naturally know what they feel? Like, yeah, maybe they sit at I love you at the wedding, but then what are you going to do afterwards? Like, you you need this constant reassurance. And, of course, God, who can read your heart, doesn't necessarily need to hear a spoken word, but you definitely do. You definitely need to speak these things loud so that you can confirm for yourself, not just for God, but for yourself that these are the things that you need, these are the things that you're entrusting the Lord with, and that these things are entrusted to the Lord, and he will do them. Okay? Now, the Lord might not answer the prayers that you have in the way that you would like, but he does listen to your prayers, and he will answer them in his time. Might take, might take years, might take a lifetime, we don't know, but he will answer them in his time. So prayer is definitely to keep the relationship going, but to keep the relationship going for your sake, that you do not um, lose confidence in, in the conversation and gradually drift away and fall into obscurity, fall back into sin and outside of faith. Uh, but uh, that you may be encouraged in the faith. Because I gave the example of uh, the atheists. Like they, like they don't communicate with God. They, they don't believe in him. Why would they communicate with him? Okay. Does that mean that they're not receiving anything from God? Does that, does that mean that God is not trying to communicate with them? No, it doesn't mean that. Because the atheists can still hear God's word. The atheists can still read the Bible. Atheists can still receive the gospel message from a whole bunch of faithful Christians who are trying to save this person through faith. Trying to present to them Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ may deliver grace through faith that this person may live in eternity. And even besides this, the, the uh, spiritual gifts, the atheists would still be receiving the physical gifts, the material gifts, the food and drink, the house, the home, the clothing, everything that God provides for us in this world. Like, because God created all things and he has brought up people inside his world to process all these things for our goods, whether they be food, drink, house, home, shoes, clothing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Like all these things originally coming from God. So the atheist is receiving all these things, but the atheist is not living out the faith. The atheist is not communicating with God, and the atheist is just shunning God and moving further and further away. So when God determines that it is time to permanently end the relationship, because he has promised to do so at the end of the age, then that person will be forever cut off from the blessings that the Lord provides the spiritual blessings as well as the material blessings. So, author of Hebrews encouraging you not to fall into that situation. But more than this, we see that the author of Hebrews is encouraging us to pray in, uh, for encouragement in a different type of relationship. And, it, and it's somewhat subtle how he does it this way. As he's saying, pray for us, we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. So, who would be praying? 
uh, for this request. Well, the author of Hebrews is not going to be the one praying for this particular request. Well, of course, the author of Hebrews is going to be praying that he be restored to um, uh, his readership. But the author of Hebrews is saying, you pray. You do this. You, you have conversations with God about this. So the author of Hebrews is recognizing that we can encourage one another to pray so that we may encourage one another to have a continuous, ongoing relationship with God. Because if you look at some of the people in uh, the church nowadays, and, and a lot of relationships with God are strained here, um, how, how often do people who attend church pray during the week? And, or do devotions during the week or, or read the Bible during the week? Because the Bible and devotions on the Bible, uh, meditations on the Bible, well, this is how God talks to us. He, he's, he's working through his word that we might hear him and that we m might have his side of the conversation. Uh, if we're not going to the word, well, we're not having that side of the conversation. We're not letting God speak to us. So that's dangerous. And on the other hand, what, when, you're say, when you're not praying to God often, well, now your side of the conversation's a little bit strained. You're not going to God in prayer. You're the one who's uh, not being built up and, and trying to maintain the relationship between you and God. So uh, quite a few people in the church, even today, like if you, if you don't have, uh, at, at the very least, daily prayers, how is your relationship with God? And it's going to be a little bit tenuous which is why coming to church for those individuals is extremely important uh, because that would be the time when they actually pray to God. That would be the time that they're hearing his side of the conversation with the scripture readings and the sermon. Uh, the sermon being the application of the scripture readings to the here and now, to the individuals that are there to hear the sermon. So during the worship service, that communication is sustained. And this is basically going on because there is a congregation that there are more people in the faith so not only is author of hebrew who's saying that we should maintain our relationship with god by praying but we should be praying for one another that we have the relationship among us as a church maintained because it's always going to be us together communicating with god not just us as individuals having our own individual faith never never letting anybody else in never letting ourselves be part of the congregation like nope nope it's my faith with god I, like I, i'm not listening to you in the congregation i'm not listening to you as we pray to god at, in the worship service well that's just plain silly it's just silly god calls us to gather together because we are having a mutual upbuilding of faith we should be praying together. We should be also even praying apart, that we go into our own uh, closets, if you will, to borrow Jesus' phrase, uh, so that uh, we can pray to God very specific prayers we might not want uh, other people uh, to, to really know about. Maybe there's a sensitive topic, I don't know. But uh, you're not doing this for showiness. You're doing this because you're actually caring about your relationship with God and other people's relationship with God. You're not doing this to show how pious you are. You're not coming to church to glorify yourself, but you're glorifying God because of what he's given you in that service. Namely, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ through word and through sacrament, delivering unto you eternal life through faith over and over and over again. This you receive, and then that's supposed to spark you into praying to God. That is supposed to spark you into uh, an active relationship with the Lord, thanking him for all that he has given, and uh, praying for, for that which you need and that which other people need. So prayer is not just about you, of course. It's like it's always about you and God, but it's also about you, God, and everybody else in the church. This is, this is also what uh, the author of Hebrews is subtly um, uh, placing in there. Like this is us together. You're praying for other people in the church. It's not just about you. It's not just about what you need. It's about what other people need. And when you find yourself being rather selfish in prayer, that, you, that all your prayers are just about uh, you, what, what do you need? What, do, what should you get? Um, start changing them a little bit. Start introducing the thanksgiving, the, 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 the praising of God. Looking to what God has done in, 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 in the creation itself. What, what has God provided? 
Because when you're asking for something that you need in this world, well, what has God already provided? Well, if you're, if you're looking for, well, I'm, I'm unsure about my next paycheck, um, Lord, can you help me with this? Well, look to God as the God of all giving, all, all bounty. He has created all things. He has promised that he will look after his children. So you go, okay, well, Lord, you have created all things. You have created all wealth. Uh, I ask you, O oh Lord, to give me enough wealth that I may live well in this world. There you go. And now your, your confidence is strengthened in God because you're acknowledging just who he is. Who, he is the God of all wealth. He is the one who will protect his children. He is the one who will give as, as is needed. So you'll find yourself shying away from, from the supplication prayers, the, the asking prayers. Uh, just because you're recognizing who God is. Then you can also also pray for, um, let's say, prayers of thanksgiving. Because even in that prayer, you're like, well, I'm, I'm concerned about my own uh, financial well-being. Well, how have you survived thus far? Well, God has given you a whole bunch of gifts. You can, you can thank God for giving you money in the past, for giving you wealth in the past for giving you uh, people who are willing to offer up uh, different things to you. Like even during your childhood, like you were receiving food and drink and clothing, presumably, hopefully. So God has provided for you in the past. So thank God for that and ask him to continue blessing you in your life to, as, as you live it. And you start seeing, ah, yes, God is providing for me as I go along. And you'll lean a little bit less on your, on your needs. And finally, to bring you out of this a little bit more, pray for others. Recognize where other people are at. Go, yes, I'm in, I'm in this trouble, but other people are in this trouble too, O oh Lord. Please help them. Help them, the, the, the homeless, the downtrodden, and everybody else. Uh, please give to them what they need, that they may live as well. And you find that in this conversation... You're focusing less and less on you because that is a very pitiful conversation that you have if you're only having a conversation with yourself. That you're just confirming to yourself, I need this, I need this, I need this. Well, now you're bringing, the prayer is bringing you out of yourself. The prayer is bringing you to God, the one who is the fountain and source of every blessing. And now with God, like you're less focused on your prayers, but you're, and you're more focused on who God is and what he is actively giving to you, what, he, what he's communicating to you. And then if you're also going to other people in, in the world and you're praying for them, well, you're further removing yourself from you, further removing yourself from your own problems so that you can see what opportunities are provided for help in this world. And in part, this is what prayer is for. Because prayer is going to be communication, always about communication. And that's to strengthen the relationship that you have with other people in this world and especially with God. It is a gift that the Lord has blessed us with, and it's one that we can definitely thank the Lord for in prayer. Amen. Now let's close in prayer, beginning with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We thank you, O Lord, for the gift of prayer. We thank you, O Lord, for the gift of Jesus Christ, who has made us holy and who enables us to come before you as holy saints, that you may hear us as those who are righteous and not those who are far off in sin. We thank you, O Lord, for the forgiveness that you have brought for us. We thank you for the blessings you so richly bestow on us each and every day of our lives. And we thank you, O Lord, for the blessings of each other, the, the fellow Christians in the church uh, that, uh, that have blessed us with their presence and their upbuilding in the faith. Um, and we ask you, O Lord, that you continue to bless uh, people in this world, those who are outside of the church with the gift of the gospel, that they too may hear and believe and come within all your great blessings here. Uh, we ask you, O oh Lord, to uh, still give all people of the world, whether they're in the faith or outside of the faith, 
of what they need for their daily needs. We know that in you all live and move and have their being. We ask you, O Lord, to be with all uh, as they live and move and have their being, so that they may uh, live in blessing to you and to one another. Thank you, O Lord, for all these great gifts. Thank you, O Lord, for the greatness of your creation. Thank you, O Lord, especially for the greatness of Jesus Christ, sacrifice on the cross, for the forgiveness of sins and the opening of us, uh, our way to salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.